Hello, everybody. I'm really happy that you could join us. Uh, and very much thank you to Mark at NAS for the invitation to tell you a little bit about some of the research that is going on at the University of Southampton uh, within the Centre for Maritime Archaeology there. Now, my name is Dr. Julian Whitetrite. Uh, I teach maritime archaeology at the University of Southampton, uh, mainly through the master's programme that we run. And unlike a lot of NAS members, my background is not one of a diver. Um, I haven't been diving for about 20 years, I don't think. Um, I might have been with Mark, actually, the last time I went, who knows? Anyway, what my background is in, primarily, is in the use of ships and boats. Um, that's what I'm interested in, is ship and boat archaeology. But really, how you build them, sail them, row them, um, think about the use of, of, of them and the people and the performance of them. And my background has always been in um, sailing and rowing traditional boats. Um, I grew up by the sea, that kind of thing. So I think as a natural extension to that, one of the things I've always kind of been fascinated by and done as much as possible is the sort of the experimental archaeology. Um, the traditional boat that I have always sailed is a replica of a ship's boat from the 1790s, um, quite a faithful reconstruction um, of one of those. So this has always been something that I've um, engaged with and done to a lesser or greater extent, be it uh, making a log boat a few years ago, or being involved in the Sutton Hoo project. So what I'm going to talk to you today about, hopefully for half an hour, um, I hope I won't overrun and go into a lunch break too much, is a project that has been running actually for a while now, maybe about five years or so since 2015, but has really gathered speed in the last couple of years, which is to undertake a full-scale reconstruction of the Sutton Hoo ship. Uh, and there's an image of the archaeological remains of this ship on the screen at the moment, on the title screen. My involvement of this has been uh, nearly from the outset of this iteration of, of, of this attempt to build the ship as one of the maritime archaeologists involved and, and principally to oversee the first phase of this work, which has been about undertaking the digital reconstruction of the ship. And this has really been very much a scoping project to, to gather together the archaeological data that we have, um, to put it together, to look at the previous reconstructions that were done in 1939 and 1940 and again in the early 1970s, but which were all done in two dimensions on big drafting boards and so on, uh, and to see what we can do with the current technology and expertise that we now have to do this. So my talk today is really going to go through that process and how we do it, the types of problems that we've had um, and so on. And just before that, I'm sure most people have a, you know, a quite a good understanding of what Sutton Who is and what it represents, but I'm just going to run through that um, a little bit first. So in yeah, maybe five-ish minutes, the Sutton Who ship burial, and, and we could spend five years talking about the Sutton Who ship burial, but we'll, we'll try and be quick. Um, so the first thing people often ask about this is, you know, Sutton, where is it? Uh, most people are, are, have not heard about the, the location of Woodbridge, uh, which is in East Anglia in Suffolk. It's a very, very beautiful old market town on the banks of the River Devon, um, just the other side of Ipswich. And the, the Devon is quite a short river, um, very windy, very tidal, so it's got a big flow in and out of there. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot like the River Bewley, actually, those of you who are in the south of England you know that river, they're quite similar. Uh, so Sutton Hoo is located there. It was part of the East Anglian um, Kingdom in the 7th century when the burial was made. And the, the whole site there and the excavation is, I mean, the excavation of it is amazing uh, and is a story in its own right. It was started in 1938 um, by the landowner, Edith Pretty who engaged a local archaeologist, Basil Brown, who did a few sort of experimental digs and forays into a couple of the mounds at the site, just to see what was there, really. And he uncovered a few sort of boat nails, as he recognised. And then in 1939, he went into one of the bigger mounds uh, and discovered more boat nails and quite quickly realised that there was a large ship buried in this burial mound. A load of other people then were brought in from all over the country and sort of luminaries in the in the 20th century uh, record, if you like, of British archaeology. The Piggott, OGS Crawford, 
uh, John Ward Perkins, Graham Clark, all at various different stages of their career and would go on to do all kinds of things. But many of them were involved with Sutton Hoo. And also a guy called Charles Phillips, who was what became one of the sort of the main interpreters um, of the ship. So this excavation was undertaken in 1939 through the summer, bringing up all of these amazing treasures and showing off this or uncovering gradually this incredible impression of the ship that was left in the ground. But with the looming, you know, it's sort of inevitability of the Second World War that was going to happen. So at the end of August, they pretty much finished the recording of the ship, uh, the impression. They would had all the material out of there and everything was packed away. They backfilled the site. Well, they didn't backfill it. They just dumped a load of bracken in it uh, and just left it. And everyone went off to do whatever they were doing um, in the war. In the 1950s and 60s, then, um, the British Museum, by this point, where all the material had been lodged and Rupert Bruce Mitford, who'd taken over the, um, the task of publishing the site, returned in order to undertake investigation and answer some of the questions they didn't know about. And particularly in 1967, they reopened the ship mound, um, or the trench rather, and, and kind of re-excavated it, if you like. By this point, uh, it had been used as a tank training ground in the Second World War, and somebody had driven an anti-aircraft sort of self-propelled gun up and down it a little bit, which wasn't great for the archaeology. Uh, so the record was a little bit diminished by this. But nevertheless, in 1975, then you have this enormous um, few volumes of publication going into all of the record of the site, which has been considered pretty definitive. Um, although, as we can see, there, there have been some changes that can be proposed and made in terms of the understanding of the ship. And then in the 1980s, you have Professor Martin Carver, the University of York, going back to the site to conduct some major open area excavations to understand the rest of the burial ground. And the site itself is hugely rare. It's one of only two Anglo-Saxon ship burials that we know in England. The other is at Snape, also in East Anglia. An amazing collection of grave goods. Um, it's very early as a ship burial site in Northern Europe. It's akin to the sort of the Vendel period sites in Scandinavia, much earlier than all of the major Viking sites that we think about at Osberg and Gokstad and Ladeby and so on in Sweden um, and Denmark and Norway. And it's really about an expression of wealth and power and religion and identity through this high status person, probably King Radwild of East Anglia, who was buried in this ship in the 620s. Um, and it also, as we'll see in terms of what's there, actually starts us thinking that maybe the Dark Ages, as we always traditionally think about them, are not quite so dark after all. Uh, maybe we just don't know very much about them. Um, and that's the, that's the problem. So the mound itself, this is just a schematic through it. It, it was, these were obviously popular targets for uh, antiquarian looters um, and robbers in the 19th century. And they had a go at mound one at Sutton Hoo. You just have an overhead shot of the site there on the right hand side of the screen. And they had a good dig into this site, but came up about a meter short. Um, there were some clay pipes found at the bottom of this robber pit when they did the excavation that dated it. Um, fairly well to the 16th century and the 19th century. And fortunately for us, they didn't quite get down to the, to the archaeological layer. We then have uh, on the bottom right of the screen, you can see a couple of the archaeologists there engaged in the survey. Um, those of you who've done NAS part ones and things and done offset surveys and that kind of thing of hulks, um, it was that, you know, it's that level of technology, plumb bobs, baselines, spirit levels, but recording 3,000 3D rivet points. Um, but we have this amazing archive of photographs that were taken by a, um, a couple of ladies who visited the site, um, Wagstaff and uh, Mercia Lack, Barbara Wagstaff and Mercia Lack, I think I've got those names right around, I always get them muddled up, that gives us this amazing set of black and white and a few color images of a lot of the work that is going on. And then OGS Crawford also took a lot of pictures. Um, he was a very keen photographer. He pioneered aerial photography of archaeological sites that give us this great record of, of sort of what it was like to excavate. Um, and also what it was like to do fairly hard survey work with a whole cohort of sea cadets standing on the side of the trench, peering in, uh, probably making comments about what you were doing um, as you were going along. These images also 
allow us to really get a feel for what the archaeological record of the site was like before it was ultimately destroyed by um, anti-aircraft gun, guns being driven up and down it, and then the excavation in the 1960s, which ultimately destroyed the site, um, because archaeology is a destructive process. But what you can see in these photographs on the left are sort of an overview looking towards the bow of the ship from the stern. Um, the burial chamber sort of area is in the middle, so there's not really any remains there. And you can see really clearly the lines of rivets. So this is a clinker built ship, overlapping planks with rivets between the overlaps. And the, the wood has degraded in the acidic soil and it's left all of these rivets in place. And they are still pretty much absolutely where they were in the original ship. You can see on the right hand picture, this is a detail looking towards the stern. So if you're ever worrying or wondering which is the bow and the which is the stern in these pictures, there's three frames of the impressions of three frames of the discolored soil that are probably where the side rudder was attached on the starboard side of the ship at the stern. And by contrast, the bow does not have these. So that's how to tell the difference between the bow and the stern of the Sun Who ship. And the hull of the ship is, is, is preserved all the way up from the keel line down here, all the way up to this line of gunnel um, spikes, which are holding the gunnel in place and which are actually holding the tholes in place, which the oars would have been against. And you can see the same on the other side of the ship. So we know that the hull is substantially complete in terms of what is there. It's tilted a bit um, to one side, which you can take in account of with the, you know, the recording. But it's actually really, really unusual within the archaeological record to be in a position to reconstruct a ship where you have the whole of the hull form, you know, from right up in the bow to right up in the stern and from gunnel to gunnel. Now, what Sutton Hoop clearly doesn't have is much of the internal structure. That's a bit of, you know, an unknown. But the actual shape, we're not guessing and conjecturing how tall the ship was or how long the ship was, as often um, happens where people have to extrapolate some of those things. So the archaeological remains are both super detailed and a bit lacking um, all at the same time, if that's sort of possible. And you also get an idea from the photographs that the runs of the rivet lines and the runs of the plank lines are really, really actually quite complete. There's a few that have fallen down here or there, you can see in the foreground of this image. But actually, in terms of the recording process, which went along at each frame station, um, and the frames are recorded, uh, uh, were visible in the archaeological excavation because of the discolored soil as they were coming down from above stratigraphically. So we're quite confident of the overall kind of shape of things. And this just gives you another um, view, if you like, looking into the ship of some of the people excavating it in 1939. And again, the detail that is there in these um, runs of rivets and runs of planks. So the vessel itself is a whopper. Um, 27 metres long, nearly, four and a half metres wide and a metre and a half deep. But it is just a big open boat, you know, super sized up. It's just nine strakes, nine clinker strakes per side, um, fastened together with over 3,000 of these iron rivets. So think, you know, your traditional kind of Viking ship way of building just a 300 years earlier um, that are spaced out. And the frame imprints are all in there at 90 centimetre intervals. And this 90 centimetre interval is pretty much what you get on all road vessels, you know, throughout history where you're stacking people up behind each other because it's just a, a, a number that works with the human body. Um, you see it on Roman ships, Byzantine ships, Viking ships. It's what you get in terms of the distance that you want to space the rows apart. The size of this vessel then in terms of what happens to it, it's buried in the ground um, and a mound is raised over the top of it. We know that from the the stratigraphy of the excavation. So these people back in the day dragged this vessel um, a mile or so up from the river, up a slight hill, 100 metres of sort of ascent, if you like, up the hill. Um, maybe they stripped out a lot of the internal structure um, to make it lighter. They built a some kind of structure in the middle of the ship that the, the king, the body was laid into with all of these grave goods. And then a, a hole was dug to put the ship into uh, and then a mound was raised over the top of it. So just all of this effort on its own starts to give you an idea of the importance of this person uh, and the effort that this community and the kingdom would, was to put um, the burial of this person to. And, and I think we can also think a bit about the investment in this ship um, 
think as I've talked about this project over the years, I, I kind of kind of liken it to one of the new aircraft carriers that um, the UK has had built recently. This is a building the ship itself is a huge investment um, in time and resources and materials. And we know the ship was a ship that was used because it has repairs in it. So it wasn't just built to be buried in the ground. It was a vessel that was used. And then at some point, the decision was taken to put it beyond use, to send it into the afterworld um, with this person that was buried in it. And they were buried with all manner of amazing, wonderful things. Um, everything that you would need in the pagan sort of religion view, world view of the early Anglo-Saxons for a, a fine party in the afterlife. Um, your best clobber to wear, your helmet of sort of Swedish origin with a dragon up the front of it um, that has been carefully sort of pieced together. Um, all of these fabulous gold um, and ruby worked uh, shoulder pieces and clasps, bowls, uh, and drinking vessels from across the, the Mediterranean, these incredibly ornate drinking horns. Um, I mean, you name it, this person had it. And these themselves speak a little bit to some of the connections that this person was able to kind of muster in the early 7th century at Sutton Hoo that this East Anglian kingdom had. Looking back across the North Sea to where the Anglo-Saxons came from, uh, the boat building technology itself is strongly linked to Scandinavia and Northwest Europe. Uh, the helmet is certainly of a, a sort of a Swedish style at that time, swords from um, sort of the River Rhine area. Uh, the bowl that was on the screen just now is from Coptic Egypt. There's other material from the Byzantine Empire, a whole sort of set of coins from France. Interestingly, the number of coins that were found in the burial is kind of roughly the same as the number of oarsmen that we think we'd have in the ship, plus a helmsman. So this might have been the the, the money that's there to pay the car, pay the, the imaginary crew to transport the ship into the afterlife. And that in itself then, the maritime technology that we can see in this enormous ship begins to you know, help us think a little bit about the wider connections. We know this material is coming. It has to come by sea for the last part of its journey. And maybe this vessel in its previous life, before it was buried in the ground, was one of the ships that was able to do that. And there is plenty sort of written about these connections. Martin Carver himself has highlighted the kind of the two way process between Scandinavia uh, and Frisia, if you like, and, and East Anglia. And that it's quite easy to come from those parts of the world to the UK with the prevailing winds at the beginning of the summer and then go back uh, at the end of the summer. It's much harder to do it the other way. And we have an understanding of the, the Anglo-Saxon use of river systems and coastal navigation. And, and actually, we often forget that the Anglo-Saxons were a people who came across the sea to England. Um, we don't really think of them as a maritime people, but actually at this stage in the seventh century, they really are a maritime people that are building these huge ships that have connections up and down the coast and have these um, this strong tradition of using the rivers uh, and the waterways of, of Southern and Eastern England to communicate with. So the Sutton Who ship fits firmly into that. And the reconstruction work that I'm going to move on to now helps us understand that and put some of the detail into it. Uh, and this is just Martin's sort of iteration of why being at sea and being in a boat is much more effective at transport than walking around the countryside or plodding around on a cart. Um, and what it's kind of showing, the one on the left in particular, the rowing one, um, you know, from Sutton who in 15 days of rowing, you can get to Bergen in Norway, but in 15 days of walking, you can only sort of get as far as York. Um, and just the contrast between where a ship and a boat can take you, you know, and where, where you can only get to by walking. Um, and that, that, I guess, really served to emphasize some of the connections of this kingdom in the 7th century. So in terms of the, the, the process that we went through for the digital reconstruction of that, um, there's a couple of boring slides now, I'm afraid, uh, but they, they're kind of important because they set out what we are trying to do as a project. There's a couple of links on the screen there. Um, they're on it again at the end of the lecture that I would say certainly the Saxon ship one has all of the information about the wider project. And the phases of this project, there's a sort of a four phase approach that Martin Carver set out back in 2015, um, which is really quite straightforward. Design the ship, build the ship, test the ship, 
tell everyone about it. That is in essence what we are um, trying to achieve with this. We finished the first stage um, and the construction of the ship is yeah, a bit on hold at the moment because of COVID-19. But we are in the phase of building a one to five model to, to learn about the sort of the processes there and to experiment with a few things and to build a full scale cross section of the centre of the vessel to understand the rowing of it, which is a, uh, an issue that has been raised by the digital reconstruction. Um, so number one is done. Uh, and we're sort of moving into the beginnings of number two, if you like, which is all quite exciting. But within this first phase of coming up with the design, we had four objectives that um, I kind of set out as what we wanted to achieve with it. First of this is to sort of get on top of the existing material, which is sort of spread across the 19, late 1930s, 1940s publications, and again in the 70s and a bit that's been done in the 90s and so on, but to sort of pull this together to see what we kind of understand. And, and actually that process is ongoing all the time because we keep revisiting how we are thinking about this material constantly. Um, to get together a basic kind of hypothetical reconstruction of things, to take that into a full construction model then, um, make sure the thing will float, won't tip over, so on and so on, so that when we build what we build, we know that it will function and work and we won't be in a situation as happened with the Osseberg replica in the 1980s where it sank, sank itself actually on its maiden voyage. And, and throughout this, we've been consulting with experts in experimental boat and ship archaeology to get their ideas about things. Um, so we've had a symposium on this, we've published papers. Uh, there's a paper out in the IJNA now, um, as of last month with the findings that has been peer reviewed and so on. So we've constantly been going through a process of asking people, what do you think about this? All right, okay, revision, revision, revision. So some of these processes for how these projects run have been set out in the, um, the Society's Journal, the IJNA, um, in this kind of flowchart. And we are kind of down here at the moment in various phases of number two and number three. Um, but enough about that. The archeological records, I think I talked a little bit about, probably too much um, just now, is, is not complete. We have an amazing archaeological record, or there was an amazing archaeological record, in 1939, certainly. And it was surveyed, um, I think, by the standards of the day and what was available to these people and the thing that was happening in the back of their minds in terms of an impending world war, um, incredibly well. Certainly, the data that they collected would be, you know, we'd all be totally happy with it today, short of dumping a laser scanner in there. So. There is that archaeological record from 1939. Sadly, the paperwork from it doesn't exist anymore because it was um, lost during the war. Um, we have this wonderful set of archive photographs, which we've looked at earlier, which you know help reassure us that what they were surveying and what they were recording was a you know it was a good record. But actually, our record itself is effectively this, which is the um, large-scale drafted plan that's held by the Science Museum, uh, who this is um, reprinted from courtesy of, which was drafted up in November of 1939, which shows you the lo rivet locations in uh, side view and plan view, uh, and a lot of the detail around the top of the screen of all the different types of rivets that were dug up, the tholes, um, and so on. But it isn't complete because it only shows one side of the ship. Um, and the assumption then was that this, they just, you know, would have mirrored this onto the other side, which, which we know isn't the case from other um, sites. The, the, the way the planks are and the widths of the planks it is not symmetrical from either side. Yeah, the overall form of the ship is probably the same, but there, are, there is asymmetry in the actual detail of the construction. But we don't have a record of that. All we have is this record of sort of one side of the, of the vessel. But this is still super... You know, super detailed in terms of the three-dimensional data that we actually have. And then we have a couple of papers published by Phillips um, in Antiquity and the Antiquaries Journal that goes through, you know, his observations on things. But the actual original raw data, we don't have that. Um, that was lost. Then the 1975 publication from the 1960s re-excavation has produced this plan, which is a sort of amalgamation of what they recorded in 1965, for which we do have the original data, 
but it's of a much less complete archaeological record. And it is clear from looking at their photographs of it that there is a lot missing. And they say there's a lot missing. And you can see where it's disturbed and those incredibly clear, coherent rivet lines that are there in the 1930s are much less clear and coherent in the 1960s. So if you like, we can kind of think of it as a, an amazing record in 1939 for which we have not a good archive. And in the 1960s and 70s, we have an excellent archive of a less good record. Um, so this has kind of thrown up a load of assumptions that we've had to make as we were doing this, that effectively the 1939 excavation is, is the most complete remains of the ship. Now that's our primary record, if you like. But a lot of the time we don't have the, we can't go and sort of ask questions of it because we don't have the information. So we have to then go and see what was there in the 70s um, to confirm these things, because this is where all of the thinking is really set out in the understanding of, of what they've had. And then, and likewise, when you have a question about the 1970s stuff, you've got to go back to some of Phillips's writing in um, 1939 to understand, and 1940 to understand what's going on. We have to accept that there's an error in the positions of these rivets. We think we know where the ends are measured to, maybe the, the head of the rivet. Anyone who has done any kind of wreck survey um, with the trust um, and the society underwater, on land, hulk recording, boat recording, whatever it might be, planning framework knows that there is definitely an error in what has been done. Even when you then scale things, you are introducing an error. So there's, we do not have an accuracy of, I would say, you know, let's just come up with a you know, 10 millimeters um, perhaps. So we know there's an error in there. We also know that in taking that raw data that we don't have for the 1939, the people who are drafting this sort of cleaned up the lines of things. They fared out some of the little errors themselves because we know that planks generally run in a nice smooth curve on a vessel. Um, so, you know, we know that these alterations have been made to things. Um, and we also know that in both periods in 1939 and 1975 there's a bit of conjecture and guesswork at the ends of the ship because it really couldn't make sense of the archaeological material because the ends of the planks have come away from the posts and it sort of collapsed down um, so that was a, a problem in sort of understanding those and then in bringing all of this together what we did was effectively said that we believe that the archaeology has is the primary thing that has to take primacy at all times, even if that is telling us something different from how other people have subsequently reconstructed the ship. Just because they reconstructed it in 1975 doesn't mean they did it right. Any more than, you know, we've done it right now. So we might come along with a better methodology in 50 years time or 100 years time um, and correct what we've done because they have better archaeological material. If we don't have the archaeological material in Sutton Hoo, then we're taking it from comparative sites like the Needham ship um, or some of the earlier, earlier Viking Age ones. And if we don't have any of that, then we have to think about, well, what do modern, you know, traditional clinker shipbuilders do? Part of the strengths of what I think we did with the project was um, that Pat Tanner, who was responsible for all of the computational reconstruction, is a shipwright. Um, I mean, that is his background before going into digital archaeology. So he has a shipwright's understanding in terms of what he's what he's doing. And then what we set out to do is to come up with a minimum reconstruction of that imprint of the vessel in the ground. Um, and to try not to conjecture, fair things out, introduce alien things or put in things that we don't think existed um, back in the seventh century. So the first phase of this was to take that three-dimensional data that was in 1939 and plot that out and then do the same with 1975 and sort of overlay them, work out what agreed, what wasn't there, what was missing, what had been added in. And all of this was done at full scale in a program called Rhino 3D. Uh, it's just a screenshot of the sort of a side asymmetric view, if you like, in a top-down view um, from Pat's work in this superimposed onto the 1975 drawing that was on your screen a few minutes ago uh, and that just that's the sort of the first phase of that because the rivet data is the primary stuff that we actually have of the, of the ship um, what we can then do is run a series of planks through that uh, to try and start to get a sort of a bit of a, a bit of a sort of lines of best fit if you like 
through this data. Um, and you can see here there's bits of rivets appearing through this wood and bits where you can't see, and that's where things don't, the sort of the fair lines don't quite fit properly. And then we can start to investigate, well, why don't these things fit absolutely as we sort of would think they would. Um, and we found in some places that we needed to rectify drafting errors. So just on the screen here, you have the natural line of this strake and all the rivets, and there's a whole line of rivets which are a couple of inches above where they should be, um, which is probably somebody sat down on a Friday afternoon thinking, I'd really quite like to go home now, just finish these last rivets off quickly. Um, and there's a sort of a line that is out of place slightly. There's a few others, individual ones that don't quite fit in. So these are all things that are quite um, straightforward to rectify, um, but, but are errors that we think are, are there from the drafting of the three-dimensional data and some of the fairing out that has gone on previously. We did quite a lot of rectification of the hood end. So this is the bit where the planks join the stem post. So these ends of the planks are called the hood ends going into the stem post. And the way they had been reconstructed, because nobody really understood these when they were excavating them. Um, so for the 1975 reconstruction, these were rectified, but in a way that is actually impossible to build. Um, they, they kind of all cluster together and you can't get, there's not enough, there's just not enough space for them. So what we did was go back to the rivet data and actually start to discover that all of these ends of these planks should be much, much lower down um, the stem post. And that's actually what we see in a lot of the archaeological evidence. That also then brought us to focus on the keel of the ship, which, and, and the shape of that, so the thing called the rocker. So if you imagine literally the bottom of a rocking horse, um, the extent to which the keel in the top picture A is flat and only curves up a bit at the end, or in the bottom picture is much, much less flat in the middle. In fact, something who isn't flat anywhere, it's just sort of nearly flat. And then that curves up. And what we found in the original material, the rivets are there, that's the line of them, but the keel is naturally attached to them. So again, a, a drafting error that we were able to rectify. And in addressing these two errors, it actually raised the, the overall shear line in this area, the area that nobody understood in 1939 and 1975 or struggled to understand, um, that was lifted up a bit. So the, the ends of the ship changed a little bit from how they pre previously reconstructed. And those were kind of the main points of, of difference. The other thing that we're then able to do within the digital software is model every single rivet, every single plank, every single thole along the gunnel of the ship and assign that a material, oak, iron, so on and so on, and then start to develop really detailed numbers for the ship, not just the basics like the length and the beam, but because you know the weight of everything that you can then calculate the displacement we can come up with a shopping list for the full scale of reconstruction of everything we need. Um, you know, we only need 3,897 plank rivets. We'll probably wreck a few, so we'll have 4,000. Um, thole spikes, frame bolts, keel scarf bolts, framing timbers, and so on. All of this can, you know, we know what we need to resource to build the full scale ship. So the, the 2018, when this work was um, initially finished, Sun who reconstruction looks like this in terms of the minimum reconstruction. Superficially, it's very, very difficult to tell the difference between this and the 1975 um, reconstruction drawing, but there are differences in the shear line, the plank hood ends, the rocker of the keel, areas that would have been problems once people started building the ship at the full scale following that old reconstruction. So part of this work has been to iron out some of the problems that the shipwrights would have encountered um, once they started to build and to raise them and highlight them now. Also allows us to just think about what the thing looks like and looked like. Um, I have actually have a, a 3D printed model of this um, sat in my office, which I can no longer access, um, which really allows you to understand the, the shape of the, the vessel. Um, Pat has then taken this one step further and dumped a, you know, a sort of a, a generic army of Anglo-Saxons into this to begin to start understanding the rowing. That has thrown up a load of interesting things in terms of um, these guys right down at the back of the ship probably can't row like this because they're too close together. Um, so maybe we're in a situation where actually we have one person on each of these seats 
and then it's double bank all the way down. This is uh, this person's in a lot of trouble because they're not sitting in line, um, so they have been uh, they've been given extra homework afterwards. And it also makes us think about the actual rowing of the vessel, um, because in a lot of cases we've discovered that if you put in normal ore ratios, um, as, as the geometry of rowing is quite well established, uh, you actually need a 25 foot long oar um, to be able to reach the water, or you need to put a lot of ballast in the boat to lower it down into the water to allow this to, to allow the oar to reach the water if you're using a more normally sized oar, basically. So either there were absolute, you know, monstrous athletes rowing this boat back in the day, or there was a lot more ballast in the boat and stuff in the boat than we'd normally associate with a road vessel. And we can investigate all of this because we have the detailed 3D modeling of things. So we're able to run all of the, the hydrostatic tests that you would do if, you know, in the ship science department at Southampton, uh, but we don't need to talk to ship science anymore. Well, not too much anyway. Um, and look at the stability curves of things and really start to go through that. And actually, um, having said we don't talk to ship science, one of the things we're now starting to do a little bit is sort of um, think about how to do this in the future um, to be able to increasingly validate the computational modeling with tank testing. Um, sort of put, a, put something in the tank and, and start to test some of these things. And what we then get from this actually is we can start to think about how the people would have been in the ship, um, how low in the water you need to sink the ship in order for it to be rowed effectively. Um, so a lot of these things at the end of the vessel is really incredibly hard to row when you are, you know, a meter and a half out of the water um, at the bow of the ship, you probably couldn't. So what we've discovered in working out the displacement of the ship, putting 42 people in it, so 40 rowers, um, a helm, and a crew, uh, some provisions for them, arms, armor, whatever, is that there's still five tons of capacity that can be fitted into this ship and it's still float at what we consider from a medieval point of view to be a safe working level. And that comes from some of the medieval codexes that talk a little bit about how much free water should be. So we're actually able to think about the Sutton Hoo ship being a cargo ship, a road cargo ship, um, as well as just the King's taxi or a warship. Because we have the hull shape and the weight, we can calculate the resistance of the ship through the water. We can estimate the wattage that a rower can put out um, based on sort of generic numbers. And we can say that probably the ship could be rowed for long periods of time at five knots or so with a top speed of maybe eight knots. Uh, and again, these are all things that it's fascinating to generate now to be able to test when we have a full size ship because that helps us understand the computer modeling in the first place and improve that for the future. So there's very much a feedback loop going on the whole time across the whole project between the digital modeling to identify and iron out problems and questions now and then how we take that forward to the full scale testing. And it also allows us to revisit some of the wider analysis of the Anglo-Saxon world. All of these times on the sea are now smaller because we know the ship can go faster carrying more cargo than Martin's estimates in 1990. So York is even closer by sea, Bergen is even closer um, because the ship is capable of doing sort of 55 miles a day, 60 miles a day, rather than the 41 um, that Martin was estimated. But there are some issues arising. Um, so we have a little bit of a different hull from our 2018 work that's yeah, been published now. Um, I think it's a more practical thing to build. There's greater rocker in the keel. We've taken into account of some of the problems that would have come about in a full size build. As a result of this and the testing, we can now think of the function of the ship being quite different from just a royal barge. We can think about it as a really effective troop carrier. I mean, this is a long ship effectively, several hundred years before the world is thinking about long ships, but also a really, really effective old cargo vessel. But the big thing that has been thrown up is that the rowing arrangement of the ship that has been assumed for um, 80 years is, doesn't work. Um, there is a huge amount of work to be done to understand that in terms of how long the oars are, where people sit and so on. And while we could do a certain amount of that computationally, it's actually much better to try and do that at full scale with real humans sat in a cross section of the ship. So that is the first stage that has gone is underway in Woodbridge now 
in the build is to finish that cross section and start um, effectively experimenting with how we row the boat and how we gear the oars and that kind of thing. Um, we pretty much hit all of our objectives for phase one. I have to say that because I sort of have to oversee it. Um, but yeah, I think we've done what we've set out to do. We have raised some questions that we didn't have at the beginning and we've answered some answers we didn't know we were worried about. Um, I think this is typical of, of, of this kind of work. And, and what we've tried to do all the way through is explain why we've done what we've done um, so that when we come to present things at this kind of forum, people can understand that and also be quite honest about why we've done things and why we haven't done things um, so that that is recorded in the future. Um, I realise I've overrun a bit and I'm probably keeping you from um, getting back to working from home, but just, you know, you can work 10 minutes extra at the end of the day today. It's been worth it. Um, I have to acknowledge the work of um, my co-partner in crime with this, Pat Tanner, uh, in doing, you know, just an amazing job in unpicking an incredibly complicated set of data. Um, that involved some, you know, we're working from home now, Pat and myself did most of this, you know, remotely, he's in Ireland, some very long Skype meetings um, to unpick things. I would visit the Saxon ship, Sutton Who Ships Company um, site. Everything is on there about the vessel. Um, there's an open access version of the IJNA paper. Some of you may have come across this already. It was free to download until ooh, about 10 days ago. Um, but there's a sort of a, a version of record that is lodged with the Sutton Who Ships Company that you can access uh, or just email me directly um, and I can probably sort something out in terms of um, sending you one of my off print copies. Okay now I, this is a pre-recording um, partly because I was unsure if I would be able to make it along in in person or remotely as it were because my teaching timetable is still somewhere in the sky hasn't landed yet uh, by the time this goes out, I firmly hope to be able to be with you for the question and answer session at the end. Um, if I don't get there, then my email is on the, at the beginning. Um, I'm very happy to take questions on this. Apologies for massively overrunning, uh, but I hope it's been interesting and worth it. Thank you very much.